Good afternoon, and thank you all for uh, staying for uh, the talk that I'm going to give and for the next speaker. I really appreciate your uh, interest in this topic. I hope you'll find it uh, stimulating and interesting. Um, it, it, I'll lay out a few dilemmas that I've faced as a biobanker. Uh, often the kinds of talks you hear about disclosure of incidental or genomic findings uh, in research subjects, is, it generally tends toward the, what the ethicists and what the law, law folks think about the, uh, the return of results. What I'm going to tell you is what the biobanker's perspective is, the, the person who has the boots on the ground, who's actually dealing with the patients, recruiting them, and uh, banking their samples. And um, I'll go through uh, what the issues are and uh, where um, I think generally uh, biobankers stand. The first uh, slide I wanted to show is, I think one of the reasons I was invited was because the research that I'm engaged in was featured in Science earlier this week in one of the News and Views. It had to do with a, uh, a, a dilemma that I faced as a biobanker. I uh, study pancreatic cancer. I'm, trying, I'm a gene discovery person based, uh, basing my work on the study of patients with pancreatic cancer, which is a lethal condition. Folks uh, can ha basically have a life expectancy of about six months. It's diagnosed so late. But um, I also do a lot of my research and gene discovery work through studying families. And so um, I, I in, recruit the family members of these patients as well into my studies. So this was a, 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 a summary, basically, of an R01 grant that actually got developed as a result of the dilemma I faced. I'm one of three co-PIs with a law professor and a bioethicist. The law professor is Susan Wolf, who may be familiar to many of you, uh, professor of law at, at University of Minnesota, and Barbara Koenig, a bioethicist who's now at the University of California, San Francisco. And we put this project together because we discovered that there's a lot of unknown territory about returning incidental genomic discoveries that uh, occur in the course of research. Uh, and who actually owns the information when you've been, uh, when the person who you actually studied is now deceased. So I'm going to uh, cover three themes in my talk. Uh, the first is to just tell you what a biobanker does or, and how we think. And so I'm going to tell you what the goals and responsibilities of genomic uh, biobanks are. I'm going to tell you uh, uh, some of the issues involved in whether or not biobanks have obligations to return research results and incidental findings. And then I'm going to tell you what the concerns are about biobank managers when it comes to research results. The, the purposes of genomic research and, and our role as biobankers in this is, you know, we're really trying to discover genes. I think this is what this whole conference is all about, is trying to understand what the genetic basis is of diseases and trying to understand the implications of that, uh, of the various uh, uh, genetic variants. Uh, we also want to be able to validate and replicate our findings, and so that requires having more samples and more patients. And then we want to apply our discoveries to novel settings. For example, some of the genes that I study were discovered in other cancers, but now they apply to pancreatic cancer. So we're looking at the implications of looking at these findings in other settings. And then, of course, the most important thing that a scientist can do is to disseminate valid findings. So we're, we're very interested in, in going through these actions when, uh, in, our, in the course of our research. What it requires is technology, tools, and resources. And I highlighted resources in orange or um, a brighter color here to indicate that the resources obviously are the patient material, the family material, the population material that we can use to actually do valid research and to disseminate something that is valid to the rest of the scientific community and the public at large. So uh, the key resource that I'm talking about are the biospecimens that we collect uh, for genomic research. And so these biobanks, and there are thousands of them across the country, uh, typically collect material that's amenable to DNA, RNA, or 
uh, biomarker analysis. Uh, we're trying to uh, collect tissues for understanding disease mechanisms. We're trying to collect the DNA for genomic analyses. Again, it's a, it's a major focus of this conference. And the biosamples we collect could be anything, plasma, urine, serum, stool, you name it, we, we, collect, you name it, we can collect it, whatever the patients uh, will provide for us. And uh, we're, we're very, uh, in terms of what I particularly am interested in as a, as a pancreatic cancer research, researcher is biomarker discovery. But then we want to, um, you know, go through this very valid process of collecting this material. So there's a process. It's very, very precise in a lot of ways. Uh, you have to be very careful. Uh, a lot of it is governed by what the Institutional Review Board tells us. But we want to be able to identify the subjects, identify subjects who are eligible. We uh, know that uh, the timing of the approach to the uh, participant can vary and be influenced by any number of issues related to the disease process, particular, particularly if we're studying a disease. And most importantly, we're worried about informed consent. We have to be very concerned about valid informed consent. The, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. The kind of uh, elements that are in, as part of our responsibility relate to the biospecimens themselves that we're managing, obtaining and properly curating these biospecimens, and then storing them for future research. We, as I said earlier, blood, biopsies, urine, stool, any number of uh, various tissues we can bring under our umbrella of uh, depending upon the kind of protocol that we develop and work out with the IRB and then decide what will advance the science the best. We also uh, want to ensure that the, there are extremely good quality control measures in place for the sample collection, labeling, data linkage, and database tracking. And I'm emphasizing this in particular because it has ramifications for what we do with results when we get them later. Excuse me. The um, issue of um, tissue processing and freezer infrastructure is a given. I mean, we just, we are very blessed here at Mayo with a superb infrastructure, and I understand that there will be tours later this afternoon, but this is really, really critical. Obviously, uh, providing the best quality materials to the investigators in the labs is, is critical, and so we, we pay a lot of attention to that. Other elements relate to how we will distribute these biospecimens. There are a variety of layers of approval that are required for uh, the scientist to ultimately get access to the material. It's one thing for an investigator who is a clinician to have a freezer in a lab and to collect whatever biospecimens they get from the patients they see, but it's another to be a biobank in which you're trying to provide a comprehensive set of samples of patients that meet a lot of different criteria for different kinds of experimental designs. And so um, the, the kind of uh, consent that you have is very important in terms of what that biospecimen may be permitted to use. This is governed by the Institutional Review Board. Uh, there uh, may be, as there is here at Mayo Clinic, an Institutional Biospecimen Subcommittee and then there's, uh, there, you may actually have a specific disease oversight access committee. For example, for pancreatic cancer, there's actually a, what we call a backpack, a biospecimen access committee for pancreatic cancer research. So for an investigator to get access to the pancreatic samples that we collect, there are three layers of approval required. Uh, and uh, so it's a process. It's just all a process. And uh, then if you uh, are uh, involved in collecting biospecimens for a clinical trial, there's another layer of the clinical trials uh, biospecimen group. So this is all information that a, 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 an investigator who's in a lab doesn't even think about and has to be, uh, has to, it's helpful for them to be aware that it's not just a matter of us going to, into the freezer and handing them samples. Now, uh, I want to thank my colleague at, uh, at the University of Minnesota, uh, 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 Brian Van Ness for putting together this very interesting paper in which he tried to describe what it really takes to run a biobank. And uh, I don't know if it shows up very well, but um, it's worth it to get this paper just to see the various sources of material that, uh, 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 that can 
go into a biobank from blood samples to tissue samples to biopsies and so forth. The uh, patient may only be signing on that they're providing a sample, but then that sample may be uh, uh, divided into any number of different kinds of uses from that point on. Uh, they, it can be turned into, and I think the next slide shows, it can be turned into plasma, serum, DNA, RNA, uh, mRNA, uh, you know, you name it, uh, the, it's, it's all, it can all be processed and stored away. Cell lines can be developed. Uh, there are any number of activities that can be done on that sample. So the one blood sample that a patient can provide can actually be split up and used in a number of different ways. And the, then the analyses would generate an incredible number of, um, of data on those samples, on those patients, um, from uh, sequences to targeted sequencing to protein biomarkers and so forth. So you're going to get a lot of results on these patients as they go through these analyses. And I put in this last one what the uh, various outcomes could be from this kind of uh, from this kind of analysis. And what I put in red are the ones that actually are results that theoretically could have an impact on the patient if you learn something about, if you learn something from this sample. Now, at this point in a lot of uh, different studies, this, uh, these various findings may be done in a lab that's three steps removed from the original uh, patient or the original biobank that collected the sample. For example, when we provide uh, biospecimens to an investigator, they may get permission from us to then share it with another, subcontract it out, if you will, to another investigator who does an analysis. So it's removed from where we are, and there may be a, a finding that may have an implication for the patient. So uh, you can learn any number of things as you um, analyze these samples. So our obligations as just from a professional point of view of disseminating results is very, it can be quite abstract at this level of, of being an investigator. We can publish our data, we can present our data at professional meetings, we can uh, provide information on, a, on the web of, in a general aggregate form. Uh, the uh, NIH, for example, um, has requirements for posting data, uh, for example, on uh, dbGaP, or the International Cancer Genome Consortium has uh, public, uh, publicly available data from our, from our samples, uh, as does the TCGA. So, um, in, and in, I think all, some of you, I don't know if it was discussed at this conference yet, but coming in January 2015, sequence data will be required to be posted if it was, if it was based on federally funded uh, research. So there's a lot of changes coming down the pike in which this data may, come, uh, may be available, and it's, it's, it's our obligation as scientists to, to uh, further research in this manner. Uh, and I'm just going to give you an example. Um, we, we, we are also trying to make our samples available uh, through, uh, through, through our website, actually. We have a publicly uh, posted website of what we have available in pancreatic cancer. The NCI asked us to post on their specimen resource locator website uh, what we had available. And if you clicked on pancreatic cancer, you would get to our Mayo Clinic spore in pancreatic cancer and all the tissue um, samples that we have available. So we, we, ha we feel it's an important obligation to let the scientific community know that these materials are available. But um, when it comes to biobanks and, and the activities, you're hearing so far just my point of view. In fact, biobanks and biobank managers are very heterogeneous. There are many dimensions to what we do. Uh, like I said, there are thousands of biobanks out there uh, numbering from several hundred patients to thousands and thousands of samples. So the, as I said, they're typically governed by IRB policies. And we're trained, um, and you know, we 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 try to our very best to follow the best practices as far as operations related to accessioning, processing, and storing the samples, and then disseminating them for investigators. Consent and contact with human subjects is not necessarily a requirement to manage a biobank. A biobanker can be a 
a curator of a freezer location, and the samples can be shipped in by FedEx and the patient by by clinicians who see the patients, and so the biobanker may not ever need to deal with uh, doing the consent. And so I put in orange at the bottom the responsibility for the return of research results that come from the samples that we disseminate is typically avoided if possible. You know, it's it's not something we uh, really. Uh, feel, uh, or I shouldn't say we, the community of biobankers in general feel is nece a necessary requirement. So I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about, well, what happens when you actually do feel that you have an obligation or feel that there must, might be a, a, a means in which you might want to return research results. And this typically happens when the person who's running the biobank actually was involved in consenting the patient as I find myself in that, um, in that role. Um, I am the PI of the protocol that consents the patient and then I manage the dissemination of the, of the samples for various research projects. And, in the, and, and I do my own research on the samples. So in the course of doing my own research, uh, I discovered various uh, tr types of uh, findings, and one of these is incidental findings. I don't know if I had this. So there are research results and there are uh, incidental findings. I just want you to know the distinction between them. Research results are findings about an individual participant that were evaluated, tested, or assayed for as a course of achieving the goals of the research. So we're into gene discovery for pancreatic cancer and we discover a gene, that's a research result. Uh, we, we discover a gene that's related to pancreatic cancer. And surveys of researchers and clinicians indicate that offering clinically useful information is an important rationale for returning individual research results. And several expert consensus groups, in fact, led by Susan Wolf among them, have identified medical actionability as a central consideration in determining whether or not a researcher should return results. So if you discover something that you really feel is medically actionable, you um, are, I, w I will say, obligated to return that result. That's, it's, you're strongly urged, if, if not obligated. I may put it that way. Whereas an incidental finding is a finding concerning an individual research participant that has potential health or reproductive importance and is discovered in the course of research but is beyond the aims of the study. So in the, in the course of my own research, I may have discovered a pancreatic cancer gene. It turns out that it's a gene related to another cancer and puts the individuals who carry that gene at risk for that other cancer uh, as well as pancreatic cancer. And that other cancer is potentially actionable. There could be steps that the person could take to avoid getting that other cancer. And that was actually the impetus for the grant I had in the first place. So this means that incidental findings may be on variables that were not directly under the, under the study and may not be anticipated in the research protocol. So, so that's the distinction. Now, what is our obligation as investigators? Uh, the, one of the solutions that was proposed is that we can report our results in an aggregate, aggregate form, for example, in the, in the form of a newsletter. So this is a newsletter that I uh, issue periodically to my investigators, uh, no, to my participants, my study participants. I do stay in touch with them. And uh, the, gene, the headline here was, a gene that causes melanoma has a role in pancreatic cancer. And it happens to be the CDCAN2A gene. And so we found that it's related to both risk for pancreatic cancer as well as melanoma. Well, I got a letter a couple of weeks later from a participant, and he's, you can't read the letter, but it says, Dear Dr. Peterson, I took your recent report to my medical doctor, and he wanted to know if I was a carrier of the gene CDKN2A. And I put in, in yellow here. He indicated I had a moral responsibility to notify my children. Please forward info of any personal blood sample for his review, sincerely. And so I was faced in real life with a dilemma about um, whether or not I should return a result to a patient. I'm gonna give you a couple of other examples that I faced. These are real life examples in which I've gotten requests. One was a request for research results 
using a medical release form. It was very interesting how this happened. We got uh, the, the uh, Mayo Clinic Records Department got a request for medical records and they dutifully fill, you know, f made a copy of the records and they sent them to the patient. And the patient wrote back and said, no, we want the results that Dr. Peterson did in her research. And, and the medical records department contacted me because research is not part of the medical record. So they were using a, uh, a, a medical release form to try to get research results. Another request came from a physician to whom the patient mentioned that they were involved in my study. And so then the they asked the physician to contact me to find out what I knew about their genetic status. And then there was a request for a genetic test result when a new cancer developed in a past participant who was healthy at the time. And the patient asked me, well, what did you learn about my genetic status? And then there was a request for a research sample to be used for a clinical test. This has happened actually several times. I actually had to create an IRB for it in which the relatives of a deceased participant wanted the DNA I had stored so that they could so that the doctor could get the sample and send it to a clinical lab and have a gene test run on it. So I'm, I'm letting you know that these are the kinds of interesting dilemmas that we face or you know, requests that we face and we try to fulfill in the best way we can. So um, I, I'm gonna just move to the issues for governance of these then because this is what these kinds of dilemmas lead us to um, is how are banks governed? And I, I just wanted to give you the answer. One size doesn't fit all. Uh, there are many, many different kinds of banks and there are many, many different ways in which they uh, should be governed depend that are really c almost custom to the issues related to the uh, protocol under which the samples were collected. Are the results traceable to individual contributors? As I've already alluded to, sometimes yes and sometimes no. Uh, and sometimes the, uh, there may be uh, uh, problems in you know, trying to make that connection back when, you, when a, a, an investigator discovers something and wants to get back to the patient for more data, for example, to do more research. That's even more of an issue. Uh, and then, um, are there explicit policies and processes for returning results? Well, sometimes yes and sometimes no. Uh, Dr. Van Ness has a, has a protocol in which his bank is, the consent form says to the patient who signs on, you will hear nothing from us. You, you will give us your sample and you will he never hear from us again. That's, that's actually an equivalent of that is in the consent form. And that, that suits a lot of biobankers just fine and they avoid the responsibility. Uh, but then you get into these issues of, as, as I've just discussed, that I have myself have faced. So if not in place, then how would it be discussed and implemented? So let's go through some of these. There, it's very complex. I think you have already started to gather that by now. Should family members of probands, or the index case, the participant, be given findings of potential health importance even if the relatives were not part of the study. And that's actually the dilemma that I faced uh, from the very beginning of this talk with the, the deceased individual's family members who were not research subjects themselves, but there was implications that of, of information we learned. What if the research subject who was tested is deceased or is now incompetent? What can we do? What is our obligation? What is the role of the research subject's legal next of kin who may be a spouse or a partner and thus not genetically related to the proband? And the proband's genetic kin, such as genetic siblings and offspring, want that information. But the, but the, uh, the, the next of kin is the one who actually is the uh, person who um, is in charge of that person's medical data. Should researchers be held to a higher standard than clinical care processes? And how should recontact and disclosure be managed? These are the kinds of issues that we are now starting to face more and more as biobankers. So how, what do biobankers think? And I thought I'd just run through a couple of uh, surveys that were done in the literature. These are just opinions of biobankers. In one study, uh, this was done, uh, researchers' opinions about, uh, uh, towards a communication of results in biobank research 
uh, a survey study, and it was 80 researchers in the Netherlands. And their bottom line here is that participants only have to be informed when results have implications for treatment or pre prevention. That was kind of the bottom line of that survey. In another survey, uh, experiences and attitudes of genome investigators rega regarding return of individual genetic test results, it was a sample of 200 corresponding authors of GWAS, genome-wide association study data, and 4%, I'm, I'm very surprised by this, that there, this even happened, but 4% had actually returned individual results from a GWAS to their participants, and 69% believe that return of results to individual participants was warranted under at least some circumstances. So it's, it's a very interesting uh, observation that came out of this set of uh, this particular survey. And then in another survey, researchers' views on return of incidental genomic research results, uh, qualitative and quantitative findings. It was a 241 U.S. geneticists, 12% had, re had returned incidental findings. 95% believe that incidental findings for highly penetrant disorders with immediate medical implications should be offered to research participants. And there's concern that return of incidental findings would impose significant burdens on research, and I'm going to talk about burdens next. The uh, attitudes, uh, this is a survey of different attitudes that um, investigators have. I, I actually can't read it uh, very well, but I think that uh, the general sense is that it's kind of all over the map about how strongly they agree and how strongly they disagree with a series of statements about whether the participant has, uh, should get results in an aggregate form, uh, what the obligation of the investigator is to return results, and what the obliga obligation of the biobanker is to return results. And it's kind of all over the map right now. And I, I think that um, we'll probably, we're kind of in a period of time where this is still a, uh, a chapter that's being written. And then uh, from the point of view of cooperative clinical trials groups, do they have a role in returning results? Uh, the response uh, was to the question, how much do you agree with the following statement? Um, the uh, clinical investigator, uh, I can't read this, I can't read it, let me just, I think that this is an important sentence that's worth reading. Um, The clinical, uh, the, the, yeah, the cooperative group bank should be um, responsible for, um, coer uh, should be, be responsible for collection of its own in, um, IRB from um, investigators. Um, but the one where there was a little bit more uh, uh, disagreement, I mean, they were all disagree, but the one where there was a strong disagreement is that the cooperative group bank should be responsible for disclosure of incidental findings and IRBs to patients. So the cooperative group biobanks really don't agree at all with the statement about return of results. So we're getting to the point where there, there's now, should biobanks manage return of incidental findings and research results? And uh, uh, P Professor Wolf had uh, uh, published a, 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 an a, a position paper that findings that are analytically valid reveal an established and substantial risk of a serious health condition and that are clinically actionable should generally be offered to consenting contributors. When re-identification of individual contributors is possible, Clarify the criteria for evaluating findings and roster, and roster of returnable findings. Analyze a particular finding in relation to this. Re-identify the individual contributor and recontact the contributor to offer the findings. So here is a whole new responsibility that um, this particular position paper put on biobanks. And they were also uh, added that the biobank would bear the long-term responsibility for the return of incidental findings, uh, incidental findings and uh, individual return of results, rather than the investigators themselves. So it, they were suddenly proposing a new responsibility for biobanks that didn't exist before. And this was quickly, uh, I won't say attacked, but there was a rejoinder published by another uh, investigator that said, the creation of a new ethical responsibility without consideration of how and whether it should be funded creates uncertainty for researchers throughout the course of their research. Uh, and 
they go through some of the issues that would happen if a biobank had to return results. They would require significant financial investment and could place an unsustainable burden on many biobanks and researchers using biobank specimens and health information. The recommendations could have a negative impact on research by creating a disincentive for the establishment of biobanks in the first place and uh, the distribution of samples and data. We would be inhibited, we would feel inhibited from sharing our, our samples and uh, the subsequent research on those samples and data might be inhibited. So there was this, all of these concerns that would be raised if biobankers had to suddenly do it. So the take home here is that bio, the take home is still, this is not a, it was a recommendation and a suggestion, but the take home right now is that biobanks do not have a responsibility to return incidental findings, including through aggregate reports. Right now they can, the status quo as we know biobanks can, can stay. And so then uh, Professor Wolf and her colleagues said, well, no, we didn't really say that. We said we urge that biobanks collaborate with the primary researchers or collection sites and secondary researchers, and we recommended that biobanks work with both the primary and secondary researchers to clarify the criteria for evaluating findings, but should let the primary researchers analyze the findings arising at their own sites so that biobanks focus on those arising later in the biobank research program system and they called for biobanks to collaborate with the primary researchers to decide jointly how to handle re-identification and they described different options including use of a trusted intermediary. But all of this is really a, a significant uh, new layer of work for biobanks. And she said leaving biobanks and biobank research systems to face the return of results challenge one by one with no recommendations to guide them uh, will reduce efficiency and increase costs as biobanks struggle individually to figure out what to do. It will also do little to advance collective and coordinated consideration of what our research community owes individuals generous enough to provide their data and biospecimens. So they're saying, well, the counter to that is that, you know, if we leave the status quo it is and everyone to th do their own thing, we're, we're not making it any easier. So I, I wanted to kind of, uh, summarize some of the heterogeneity and complexity in the return of research results. The processes, the priorities, the structures and governance vary with the purpose of the biobank. And I think that it, that it still is in some ways very much an individual decision that's made by the person who's managing the biobank. Managers of biobanks are of mixed opinion in an obligation to return results of incidental findings. I think you saw that in the surveys and in the different points of view that I've raised here. The science can potentially be compromised. Uh, for example, it would be easier to just strip them of all identifiers once you got the blood sample and then just, you know, distribute them. But you can't imagine the richness of data that you would lose um, to distribute samples with very little annotation. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an option that I personally have not pursued with my own biobank of pancreatic cancer. And then the discovery of a finding that may occur several layers of oversight removed from the biobank managers can really uh, create a, a uh, problem. Uh, and in fact, um, you know, you may discover a, a gene test, a gene discovery about a patient that another lab analyzed you know, across the country and then what happens in terms of your obligation. And then we've always been very cognizant of HIPAA and the regulatory obligations, the IRB policies and so forth, and, and those need to be paid attention to. But as a course of the research that's going on right now in terms of the ethics and the, uh, the management of incidental findings and return of results that's going on right now with large sequencing samples uh, is, is is probably going to uh, re result in some changes in uh, policy uh, recommendations for IRBs and so forth. That's my prediction based on uh, my activities that are going on with the uh, with the uh, CSER group uh, of the uh, NHGRI and the NCI. And then uh, there, uh, the the unknown, the unstated or unacknowledged really issue is the burden and the cost. Uh, managing return policies, they do have real time, real costs. The time, the FTE, the processes that you'd have to put in place. What prior consents and contact information do we need to collect if we choose to go down this path? 
and what would constitute a reasonable chain of custody of a biospecimen or identifiers, and what is the extent of the responsibility? What would constitute due diligence? How far do you have to go to say, well, I tried to find this patient and they're lost to follow up, and will someone come back and tell me, well, you didn't do enough? Uh, and should the test be confirmed in CLIA labs? That's another issue altogether that we um, get faced with. The take home here is that research biobanks are not legally obligated at this point to retain identifiers or contact information of subjects who contribute samples. That's the current state of affairs. And as I said, I, I don't see this one changing significantly in the near future or, or even the near near distant future what i what i uh, uh want to just summarize in my final uh comment here is that uh the themes i had addressed i tried to set out at, at the beginning uh have the three take homes that i tried to uh bring in throughout the talk what are the goals and responsibilities of genomic biobanks where we optimally support gene discovery through provision of annotated quality DNA and biospecimens. That is really where the best research can, uh, can occur. Do biobanks have obligations to return research results and incidental findings? Right now, we do not. Um, and uh, we don't really have an obligation at all right now to do anything. And then what are the concerns of biobank managers when it comes to research results? We're not legally obligated to return identifier, to retain identifiers, I'm sorry, to retain identifiers or contact information of subjects who contribute samples. Um, again, this might change with some policy recommendations that might come down the future, but I think that that'll happen more at the level of the consent process and the IRB and what the uh, investigator who's going to be running the biobank and, and, and consenting the patients truly decides what they're really going to commit to do in terms of their relationship or their obligation to the participant. So in conclusion, I just want to summarize what I've said. The biobanks exist to collect, curate, and manage diverse types of samples with the goal of advancing research. I mean, that's what we're here for. We're scientists. The vast majority of existing biobanks do not have the resources to establish and fund processes to return research results and incidental findings. And I put burden here because that's a really, that's probably the biggest argument right now with uh, any kind of policy change that would occur. And then for biobanks in clinical settings with linked identifiers to participants, consideration of return of results and potentially incidental findings is possible. And in fact, I'm personally involved in a research project with our own data uh, in which we are, we are returning results. And then managing the return of re research results to individual participants or families will require the resources and processes so that the science and the participants will benefit. And I just want to acknowledge a number of my colleagues, Susan and Barbara, of course, my co-PIs on the R01 grant, but a number of other folks who made uh, the biobank that I currently run possible, and a number of my colleagues, and of course, funding that made the biobank um, exist in the first place. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Uh, you've lots of questions coming in on this topic, um, and uh, a, a nice variety of them. Some very, very practical and specific that I thought maybe we would start with one here, because I gather it's probably somebody out there who's got an idea in mind. And they ask you, what is the process for external researchers using Mayo Biobank samples? Are there restrictions for use? I alluded to that a little bit. There are layers of... Uh, of uh, approvals that are involved. If you as a, you have nothing, you have no relationship at all with anyone from Mayo Clinic, uh, the advice that I give to anyone who approaches me who wants to use, for example, our samples, uh, is to identify someone at Mayo Clinic who is willing to be the principal investigator of an IRB that will permit the use of that sample. That's the best way, that's probably the only way you can do that. Um, and uh, in fact, on the public website that I show, we require that you talk to the you talk to me, or you would talk to the person who manages the biobank, and they would work out a system where you, your protocol and uh, the Mayo investigator would 
would run it through the system here at Mayo for you. Now, I think that you touched on this, but I just want to be super clear since, since we did get another question as well. And it asks, are you obligated to give patients everything they want? And is there some sort of infrastructure that exists right now for tracking those requests and preferences? Uh, the tracking, that, let me answer the second one first. The tracking that we do is done pretty much on the individual participant basis. So we do keep information about a request that comes from a patient with that patient's file. You know, data, it's part of the database that we have on the patient. Are we obligated to provide everything on a patient? Is that, was your, yes. is that your question? Mm -hmm. The answer is no. No. In fact, I've been sitting on gene test results for years. Why? because I haven't had a mechanism by which I would return the results. Uh, the, 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 the very first slide I showed with the funeral, the people standing around the grave site, was the results I've been sitting on are results on deceased individuals. And the dilemma that was the subject of that article was that I didn't, I, I didn't know who, you know who owned the data. Mm -hmm. Who owns the data? And that was an, another question that I was just going to bring up. So that's really sort of still uncharted territory. Who owns the data? It's well, it's not actually uncharted data. I, I actually learned a lot in the course of the research I'm doing. HIPAA is very clear about who owns the data, and it's the uh, it's the, uh, the personal representative or the next of kin uh, who owns the data. The, pro the dilemma for genetic information is that the next of kin is is may not be my husband. <laughs> may not be right let's just say i'm going to i'll give you the funny the, the 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 story the the next of kin may be the gold digger who married the the <laughs> dead man and now is we're now estranged from good. the kids who would benefit from the genetic information it's a real case the and they the kids are estranged from the the spouse I think we have to congratulate Dr. Peterson because I think that might be the first use of Gold Digger at the Mayo Individualized Medicine Conference. So now we're really getting here. All right. Yeah. We've had more than more than one situation where the mother of the the, the stepmother and the children who would benefit from the genetic information were estranged. Another excellent practical question here from our group. Is there a best practices version of the consent form for genetic research? Uh, is there a best practices? They're, they're in the process um, through this uh, CSER consortium right now of developing some, of the, some uh, template wording. I think actually the Mayo Clinic is following that very closely and has uh, pretty good wording mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One more, um, if a patient is excluded from a study due to criteria identified, you know, such as HIV, pregnancy, that sort of thing, is there any obligation to notify the patient of the results? And this person asks, are biobanks being held to different standards when it comes to genetic findings? Um. Okay, that, there are two very different questions. I'm not sure I can answer that first one. Um, if, if, if during the course of your research in trying to rule a patient in or out and you discover something like HIV about that patient um, and the person's really not eligible to be in your research, but the, pa the question is how that HIV was discovered. If it was discovered from a research blood sample that you tested to determine eligibility to be in a research project, um, I think that that's reportable. I think, you, I think you have to obey the law. So I think regardless, but that's a really good one for you to bring up with your IRB. <laughs> I actually don't know the answer to that specifically. Um, Would there typically be uh, that individual's physician involved that you could reach out to in that case and have the conversation? Potentially, and there are scenarios that w I have heard uh, where research, research results have been returned, where there has been an intermediary, where the biobank uh, did convey it to a third party to do the to, to, to do the transmission of the information. Um, very, very different kinds of scenarios out there. And do you want to answer the, the uh, different standards question? So I raised that in, in one of my slides. Um, I, I don't, I, 
Uh, we worry that we do, but we haven't necessarily been held to it. I think that there, uh, the issue of should uh, research labs meet CLIA standards? Should research labs perform a CLIA kind of test before they return the result? Um, that has not actually not been the case. Research, result, research labs are not necessarily held to that standard. So right now, the answer is no in practice, to my knowledge. So uh, this one I, I'm also curious about here. If you're in a position where you need to inform family members, in your view, is there any rule of thumb about in, informing them individually as a group? Any guidance on that kind of a situation? It's very interesting, and I, I'm going to—I don't know if I should <laughs> reveal a, a, pro a protocol we're developing right now. But we made the decision to return the result on a deceased individual to the family members in a conference call, because we knew that the minute we would, if we were to do it one by one. Uh, we knew that there's, you know, they, they texted immediately what the result was, and we didn't want that to happen. We wanted everyone to learn at once. So we're, think, we're toying with that particular design element in the project we're working on. Hmm. And was that just a, a timing concern, or was there also a sort of um, wanting to make certain everybody heard the same exact message? That's, that's exactly it. I mean, if you were to tell the... Um, spouse what the result is and that that spouse could just basically put it on Facebook and for all the family members to see that you know their dad had this gene okay and you, the, the implications of that is is you know we, we didn't think that we would we wanted more control of of what the information meant mm -hmm. and so um, we're thinking of a conference call mm. yeah because you are dealing with such sensitive information mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, um, maybe more gold digger talk uh, <laughs> after we break this afternoon. Let's thank Dr. Peterson. <laughs> okay, thank you.